Thursday of whatever week we're on, I'll say seven, I'm not real sure, but uh, week seven, second day here. And uh, I do know this, that uh, we got a little start here into chapter 27, and I'm 28, and we finished 27 and uh, did some examples last time. And uh, so I trust you're uh, working on those and we'll continue to work on those. Would even encourage you, uh, especially if you found 27 uh, fairly simple, which I'm, I'm hoping you will. It, uh, as, you, as you saw, was about current and voltages and uh, Ohm's law. And get us started really into the, the meat and potatoes of resistors as we get here into chapter 28. And so 28, as you know for the first time, uh, we put more than one resistor in, in the circuit. And uh, we put two actually. And so we'll extend that. We'll go three, four, and hopefully set you up so that you could have any number. And uh, other than the math might get kind of long and kind of hard, you, you could do an infinite number of uh, resistors. So that's kind of where we're headed. We'll talk a little bit about batteries. And then at the end of the chapter, we'll throw in capacitors. So we'll have resistors and capacitors in the, in the same circuit. And that's where we're, we're headed here. So that's where I kind of want to get started. But I thought, oh yeah, let's remember this time since I was hooking up a bunch of circuits and uh, get, getting kind of ready and uh, actually d always debating with myself, but said uh, it's, it's well worth it. I never know if it's worth taking the extra time to, to set it up during class, but uh, I think it's good. I think it is good when I am able to draw it on the board and I can hold it up here and say, does what I have hooked up here <laughs> look like I have what I've drawn on the board? And so just going through, it's what's good about the labs. And so as many of you know, you did the lab yesterday. Another third of you do the lab this afternoon. But just that, just that chance to hook it up and get your hands dirty. So as I was hooking it up, I did remember that, oh yeah, we were going to overcharge, if, if you will, or put too much voltage on a capacitor and, and see what happens. So I thought, all right, we'll start there here. Let's, let's give that a try. So I went back to my stash. I found some old ones. I'll send these around so you can kind of look at them because I don't think you'll get a good look from here. But here is one. It's, you can see uh, maybe the metal cylinder and uh, it got, you know, um, vaporized on the inside. The pressure built up and the rubber stopper used to hold it together then popped out. And then you can see the cardboard that is used as the insulator to wrap it up. Some of these other ones I've done in past years are a little more significant. That one kind of busted out the side. Most of these metal can ones just pop up off the top one. I wish I had some more of these old metal can ones. They, they just have a rubber stopper and shoot up uh, the top. And they're kind of neat to see. I'm out of those. Uh, recently I've been switching to these. They seem to pop pretty good. So that's what I have now here. So I thought, well, I'll start off by putting them in a Petri dish. If you want to look at it, you can take a look at them. And I think it gives you uh, a better insight to what I was showing you earlier in that chapter with capacitors, how it's just two conductors. You put an insulator in between, you roll it up, and you, you make a little cylinder out of it. So we'll give it a try here quick. Here is that little tiny cylinder. Here is, I'll check the voltage before we got started. I set it at 10 volts. Good. Because uh, I think that's uh, enough to do it. Um, we'll give it a try here. I will hook one side up and the other side before I turn it on. And if we are so fortunate, we might actually see the crazy thing heat up and then pop. Let's... Oh No? Go, go, go. go. <laughs> see, is it even warm? Well, it's not going to happen now. It's probably not going to happen. More voltage? Start lecturing you pop. <laughs> But, uh, uh, all right, well, try another one. Yeah. All right, well, that's what I got these old ones for. It is starting to get warm, but it's handling it well. Oh, well, that's as much. 
Well, okay, well. <laughs> yeah, uh, suppose we could fry it just from the heat, but it's not quite what I wanted you to see. Oh, uh, well, I don't think anything different than hopefully what we're about to see. Uh, um, try another one here. Hopefully one of these will get... Well, see, I just... I'm afraid I just can't find any that work real well. But a few of these have worked, as you'll... It's getting hot. But... Oh, there it goes. <laughs> then it got hot. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, good. I got another one to put in my little can over there. All right. So, yay, it did get hot. All right. <laughs> Try it again. Well, I, I attempted, but see, this is my stash that I have. So I've only got a few more years left here. So I, this was a full box when I started teaching 15 years ago. So now it's, it, it's dwindling. You're, you're one of the few left here to, <laughs> to see them. And uh, there's got to be some out there. I, I got to figure out where to, where to get some more. I keep saying that each year. And it, each year gets closer and closer to the end. And I usually, uh, uh, you know, try two or three. I feel like I go through two or three before I finally get one that pops each year. So... It's only a couple years left there in the, in the stash. All right, well, um, hooking this, uh, let me, what I do with these things, just so I remember to put that into the show and tell Petri dish here. Let's try something a little bit different here. Let's look at some light bulbs and pick up where we left off and get into some circuitry here. Uh, you might recall from the last time we met, uh, maybe I'll give myself a little more room, is we started uh, hooking up our circuits. And uh, as I mentioned, probably the good news in here is that we're not going to learn any new physics principles, no new uh, principles in terms of conservation of charge or conservation of energy, but what we will do is we will use that principle again and again and again to now hook up some really complicated circuits and see what the advantage of series and parallel is. And I hope this little setup that I'm about to show you really illustrates that. So let me do a hookup. Let me do a voltage here. I'll just put a little battery and call it V, although this time I'm going to do quite a bit of voltage. Uh, I'll do 120 volts. Uh, in case you don't know, uh, these wall sockets are what? Yeah, they're 120 volts. That's kind of the standard here in the North American grid. If you go to other countries, that could be different and probably is different. Uh, but in North America, which would include Canada, United States, and Mexico, that's our grid. We're kind of all hooked together. We have 120 volts. Now, it's a little more complicated than that, as you will see as the semester goes along. Uh, it is not just straight what we'll call DC, like this power supply. When I set it at 5 volts, it is always 5 volts. Is that how the wall plug works? Does anybody know? No, it's what we call AC, meaning what? Alternating. It alternates, right? And so it goes big and small, big and small. And it turns out, as we will discuss later on in the class, that this wall plug voltage ramps up to about 170 volts. Uh, then it drops down to zero, then it goes down to a negative 170, and it keeps changing. So sometimes it is very high, sometimes it's not so high, sometimes it's only 30 volts. Bottom line then is that is equivalent in terms of power at 120 volts. So more on that discussion later on, but for today, let's just say it is a straight constant 120 volts. That's not quite true, but it is a good uh, 
simplification of what's going on. We'll add to that later here. So let's just say I'm going to go 120 volts. So that's why I've got what Don affectionately calls our suicide plug. Because I'm just going to put this straight into the wall and grab these cords. Not literally. I'll hopefully be careful with it. But I'm just going to plug in that 120 volts. And then I am going to hook up what I will call resistor 1 and resistor 2. And I could hook them this way, which we called series. Or I could hook them this way, R1 and R2, which what we called parallel. Will I get a different effect? Oh, absolutely. That was the point of this discussion. I mean, that's why we had a different equation. I mean, we learned how to get the equivalent resistance here. What is the equivalent resistance for this case? Yeah, and so we learned that the equivalent resistance is the sum of those two. And that was a little proof we went to at the end of last class. Whereas this circuit this could be equivalent to what? Yeah, and so we'll take a harmonic sum here in order to figure out what the equivalent resistance is. All right, so I have up here two light bulbs. Now, they have a different resistance. In fact, this one says on top 40 watts. This one says, I'm thinking 25. Can't really read it. I'm going to call it 25 anyways. But it's 25 and it's 40. And so if I were to use this in a house, if I were to use these two light bulbs, how are they hooked up? Would they be hooked up like this? Or would they be hooked up like this? Let's think about this for a moment. Well, what would something like this give me? I mean, this is called series because the electrons, and if it's okay, I'll call current this way, okay. So the current flows this way, goes through resistor one and resistor two, right? So whatever goes to one goes to number two, right? What happens if I unscrew light bulb number one? Or light bulb number one burns out? What happens to light bulb number two here? Do you see that? Are you getting the picture of here? This one would go out, wouldn't it? If you stop the current from going to this one, they can't continue on to go to this one, right? And that's what we mean by series. It, you go from one to another. That silly example I gave you last time about going to Lake Kachuma. If I can't get down Highway 101, and for that matter, not another road, alternative road, but if I can't get to Highway 154, there's no way that I can get to Lake Kachuma. I can't get on Highway 154 because I just can't even get to 101. So the, the, the getting on Highway 154 is, is useless. I can't get there. I can't get any electrons to the second one if the first one. Now, is that how your house is hooked up? Right? If the light bulb in the bathroom goes out, does that affect the hallway? Right? It doesn't. Do you have to turn on the TV to make the microwave work? <laughs> no, okay, so I don't think my house is wired this way, is it? It is probably wired this way. Do you see a difference in this? What would this do? Yeah, this would probably make more sense for a bunch of independent elements, right? This would make sense that I could turn the light in the bathroom on and off independent of the, of the hallway. Because look at this one. What happens if light number one goes off or burns out or gets unscrewed? Well, what happens to this one? Can't the current still go through light bulb two? See how the current in light bulb tube has nothing to do with the current in light bulb number one? through two without going through one. And so that is kind of this difference, one of many differences between hooking something in series and something in parallel. So I suspect, and rightfully so, that when I hook up a pair of light bulbs, my house is wired and so I will hook these two light bulbs up this way first. I will want to jump over there so you can see this. But if I hook these two light bulbs up in parallel, let's see what I get. Now let me just check, is this plug active? Should be, okay, so I'm going to 
assume this far plug is active and that one's plugged in. So I'm not going to plug it in yet, but I'm going to hook up these two lights. So again, just to make sure you visually see this, how do I hook them in parallel? Well, I guess if I take this wire here, that, if I plugged it in, would be just hooking up this 40 watt light bulb, right? So how could I get the 25 watt light bulb also hooked up here? And so maybe I'll grab a couple of wires. I'm wondering if I should pay attention to their color at all here. But if I go here, and maybe I'll match left to left and right to right just to kind of keep my thoughts straight. Does this look like that now? Right? They're in parallel? And so as I look closely at this, I am going to see that the current can go in this lead, go through, and when it gets right here, it can go either A to this light bulb, 40, or can jump over and go that one. So in this picture, I will call then this one the 40 watt bulb, and this one Pen to get kind of dry. And this one, the 25 watt bulb. Okay? And they both should go on here as they cross over. All right, so I'll go ahead, plug it in. They both go on. And this one is obviously a little brighter than that one, right? 40 watts, 25 watts. And if I were to unscrew one of them, say this one, what would happen? Well, of course it goes off, but that one stays on, right? If I unscrew this one, what happens? <laughs> it goes off, but that one stays on, right? Fair enough? Question for you. Which one of these two has a lower resistance? Or do they have the same resistance? <coughs> so at the end of the last chapter, how did we learn to calculate power? Okay, we derive this, current times voltage. Uh, that probably won't be too helpful here. Let's do another step here. We could have done a substitution. If we do Ohm's law here, we get Ohm's law. We get I squared R. So there's another option. I'll put option one, option two. Uh, but I also could do Ohm's law and put voltage over resistance here and get... So I really have three options as I look at this. My question for you was, what about the resistance of these two? Which one has a lower resistance? Well, I suppose I could rule this out because this makes no sense. It doesn't even have an R in it. So I want to compare these two. Fair enough? Now what do I know about light bulbs or anything that is hooked up in parallel? They have the same voltage. So I would claim, if I want to look closely at this, I know that each light bulb has the same voltage, 120 volts. Yet they end up with a different power, which tells me they have a different resistance, which also tells me which one has the lower resistance. Which one? The one with the most power, right? To get more power, don't I need Less resistance, isn't that what that's saying? Or to put it another way, thinking of it this way, back when I'm talking about power, since they each have the same voltage, 120 volts, the one with the most power is going to be the one with the most current. The most current you get when it has the least resistance, right? So whether you want to look at it here or here, I would argue that the 40 watt, has a lower resistance than the 25 watt. 
And I'm hoping that kind of makes sense. You're saying, okay, well, that, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, you want that higher resistance in the 25 because that's going to reduce the current down. And that's what you see. You see less brightness in the 25 compared to the 40. That's why we call it a 25 watt bulb. All right. So if that all made sense to you, what if I were to hook these in series? Not, not to say you are going to hook them in your house in series, but I have these loose wires purposely because I could hook them in series. You have a question? I'm just going to say, it's going to be great brightness with the power. Okay, and why? Fair enough. There's a, and there, there's other reasons too, so that's why I was seeing where you were going with it. But in this case, let's just say they're both tungsten filaments giving off the, the same. So I have something to compare them to. All right. So assuming uh, they are the same material and other things, um, you know, they're. Uh, but I think these are both the old-fashioned incandescent tungsten filament. Just get it hot, and so I, I, I think we could compare apples to apples here. But, but you're right, there are other efficiencies to light that less power could still even be brighter. I think that's what you were going, right? If I did a fluorescence or compact fluorescence or LEDs, especially LEDs, they can be extremely bright and have very little power. So, but being the same ones, I, I think we're okay. All right, but now I want to hook them in series. All right, so let me just double check. Suicide plug is unconnected here. All right, I'll disconnect it. How am I going to hook these in series? Well, here's the power, right? It's going to come in, and it, to be in series, the current would have to go to the first light bulb. After going through the first light bulb, um, which we called R1, right? The 40, yeah. So there's R1. Then it goes into R2. And then it goes from R2 back to my power supply. Fair enough? So again, does this look like this picture? Right? It does, doesn't it? Okay. So I have then this power, which I will plug in. Which one will be brighter? Will this still consume 40 watts and this only 25? Yeah, I wouldn't think it would still be the same. I mean, why do we call it 40 watts? We call it 40 watts when it is hooked up correctly, right? When it is hooked up like it is designed to do. When it is designed here, I could then calculate what resistance number one is. Fair enough? And so let's go ahead and do that real quick here. If I put 120 volts and I square it, and then I put 40 watts here, and I go to calculate resistance number one, I will get a number for resistor number one. Um, likewise, if I put resistor number two and set this at 25, I could get resistance number two. And as we already said, one better come out to be a little bit smaller than the, the other one here, number two. So let's see, I've got 120 squared here uh, divided by 40. And this then is, did I do that right? feel like I miscalculated there, but I, I think that's right. 360 ohms there. Why is this one? 120 squared divided by 25 gives me 576 ohms. Okay. And so as we concluded already, the resistance of number one is smaller than the resistance of, of, of number two. And that smaller resistance allows more current and that's why we have more power, at least when it's hooked up that way. Keeping that in mind and coming over to here, and I'll just put, okay, there's 360, there's five, what do I have? 576. What do you think might happen here? Are we still going to have 40 watts and 25 watts? No. Not even close. Right? In fact, which one will be brighter here? Isn't this one going to be brighter?
I mean, let's come back over to here. Wouldn't we say that the power consumed in here would be either this one, this one, or this one? And this might be a good one to look at. Because what do we know about the same that are series? Same current. So as I compare the two light bulbs, aren't they going to have the same current? Now they have different resistance and hence they will have different powers. So which one's going to have more power? The bigger resistance one. Right? And didn't we say that is the 25? And again, I'll call it a 25 watt, but it won't really be as bright as 25 watts because it will be hooked up incorrectly. Okay? But it's worth doing the calculations before we hook it up here. I mean, let's do this. If I came over to here to get the equivalent resistance then, um, what do I get? I get uh, a 6, a uh, 13, carry a 1, I get 936, right? So when I go to calculate the current, the current would be 120 volts divided by 936 ohms coming out to be... 120 volts divided by 936 ohms and I get a point 1, 2, 8 amps for the current in that circuit. Okay. Now I didn't actually do any calculations for the amps here. Maybe I should because why do you think this current compares which is a current all the way through the circuit, to say the current in just light bulb number one here. How did I get current number one? How would I get current number two? And so you can see what I'm doing. I'm just trying to do an example of circuit analysis. Let's look at what do we know about series and parallel, right? And I'm hoping you'll see here that current number one here would be 120 volts divided by the 360 ohms. And current number two would still be 120 volts because, again, that's what it's hooked to, right? It's in parallel. And the uh, 576 ohms. And so again, as I do a quick calculation, 120 divided by 360 is a third of an amp. That's why I was saying over here is, will these be just as bright? Oh no, right? I mean, look how much lower the current is here, right? Up here, compared to here, right? Here I'm getting a third of an amp going through that light bulb. But when hooked this way, I get, that's about an eighth of an amp. Right? And when I do this calculation, which is 120 divided by 576, I get 0 0.208. Obviously less current in here. That's why it was less bright. But still more than I'm getting over here. So but needed this much current, and I'm not even going to get that much brightness out of it. So, those of you who saw it, I think you're starting to get a feel for the circuit, and so far we just made a simple circuit. There's only two resistors. We're going to look at three, four, five, and, and hopefully give you some intuition in here and say, uh, here's how I hook it up. What, what's going to be new? What's going what's to change here? But I claim then, if I go to calculate the power here, the power on this one would be I squared R1 and the power on this one would be I squared R2 and so that number is relatively small compared to what we just saw. I mean let's see what it comes out to be. I'm going to take that current 1.28 and square it and then multiply it by 360. And if I do that, I'm looking at close to 6 watts. <laughs> That's a big difference in 40, isn't it? Alright, so I don't know. Should we call this a 40 watt bulb or a 6 watt bulb? Alright, I'll still call it the 40. But of course, when I call it the 40, what I mean by that is 40 when I hook it up right. I hook it to the right power supply and I hook it up in the right fashion. Because I hook it up something different, I get a different result here. So I'm only going to get about 6 watts from this bulb. Over here, as we said earlier, this should even be more wattage than that one. But not still nearly the 25 that I would have gotten over there. So 0 0.128 squared times uh, 576 is about 9.4 watts. Okay. So again, 
hooked up this way, we're just not going to get as much power. And hopefully it makes sense because hooked up in series, you have an overall larger resistance, don't you? And that overall larger resistance means less current through the whole circuit. And that's where our power comes from. Our power is a combination of voltage and current. And by hooking them up this way, I'm not going to get much current. By the way, a nice little quick play on mathematics would be, is if I put a number line on here, and I look at resistor 1 and resistor 2, and when I add resistance 1 plus resistance 2, isn't the answer always going to be over here somewhere? Doesn't the result of these two positive numbers added together always have to be bigger than one individually? See, keep that in mind when you do harmonic sums. If I do a little bit of math here, and maybe on my number line I'll put the number 1 right there as a reference point. But if I take some resistance here, call this maybe R1, and some resistance here, R2, the reciprocal would go here. The reciprocal of that one would go there. Fair enough? Somewhere inside of one. Now if I add those two reciprocals together, that reciprocal plus that reciprocal, I get something maybe here. Take the reciprocal of that, where do I get? Here. And you will hopefully see that no matter what you do, when you do a harmonic sum, the result of those is always less than the resistance of any one individually. So when you have things in parallel, the equivalent resistance is less than any one individually. When you have series, the equivalent resistance is more than any one individually. Fair enough? And of course, hopefully conceptually that makes sense. You would expect that the resistance total or equivalent should be more than any one individually because you already have one individually and then you're tacking on more to it. Or one individually and you're tacking more onto it. So you kind of expect the result to be bigger. And likewise here, you expect the overall equivalent resistance to be less because if you just had one by itself, you would have a certain resistance and now what you're doing is adding another path. It would be like building another road on the highway. The overall resistance now is a little bit less. And so you have a second alternative path. Even if this is a big number. I mean you could build a small ro road on the shoulder where you only uh, somebody could walk. And I guess that's technically less resistance than you had before you had a walking lane. You just had cars. Now you have cars and walkers. Hopefully they would add a whole new lane. It looks like we're getting between here and CARP, so we're going to have a whole new lane someday. So that should be less resistance as we drive from here to Carpinteria here. We have another alternative path. And that's what I wanted you to see in here. So I just wanted to take a moment to play. Give you some kind of gut feeling as you hook these up and, and, and say, okay, this is how they would work. Okay. Well, as I said, we could calculate the current and the power, and we just did. And so we should be able to hook them up and plug them in. So I think I already hooked it up, if I remember right. Yeah, so there's the, the series connection. So now watch what happens when I, I plug it in. Which one is brighter? Right? Isn't that 25 watt bulb? Which is not operating at 25 watts anymore. Okay, what do we get? About 9? And truth be told, it's probably even a little brighter than that because if we add to this, isn't this resistance also connected to how warm it is, which is connected to how bright it is? So chances are this 360 ohms is not what's happening right now because I'm not operating at its full power. But that aside, let's say it is, you will quickly see then that this bulb here is brighter than than that bulb. And I get a different effect. What happens if I unscrew one of these? Right? That's what we said earlier. You take this one out, that one is go out. That's why we call it series. Unscrew that one, 
that one is going to go out. That is a series connection. Those are the good and bad things about a series connection. And I joked with you earlier that you don't have to turn on your TV to run your microwave. But you probably have come across series connections, at least in simple places. Like light bulbs in a Christmas tree light. Right? Kind of a pain, right? What happens when one light bulb goes out? The whole string is out, right? And you're like, oh, which bulb went out? And about the only way is to go get a new bulb and pull them out one by one. <laughs> Until you get fortunate enough to pull out the burnt out one and put in the good one and then the whole string lines up. And you're like, yeah. And then hopefully you don't have two that's burnt out. <laughs> when they're in parallel if you unscrew one the other one's going to get brighter oh um uh, let's see his question if you didn't hear it is okay and when they're in parallel this way if I unscrew this one so let me kind of erase that yeah. okay how come that one doesn't get brighter well it would only get brighter if there was more current right um I don't know if I would use the word sharing the current I would say the current is going through this one and this one but when you take this out the resistance here is now uh, I don't know if you want to call it an infinite resistance or it's gone this pathway is gone but the resistance here never stopped the current from flowing here so it still is pushing the same amount maybe I put some numbers here when both light bulbs are here okay we calculated the current to be 0.33 through this bulb. We calculated the current here to be 208 through that bulb. So what you are saying here from conservation of charge is the current coming out of this battery has to be the sum of these two, which is 0.541, uh, right? So what was happening with both bulbs in here is I was getting enough current out of here to feed this one and to feed this one. Okay? If you think of this in terms of water flow as we often do, a good analogy might be I have the sink in the kitchen running and the sink in the bathroom running. If I shut off the sink in the kitchen then the water coming into the house from the street goes down. But it goes down to the same amount that is needed in the bathroom. It doesn't change the amount in the bathroom. The bathroom keeps operating at the same current or the same flow. Uh, minor exceptions because there could be some internal effects here. The what? The amount of current comes out, changes, yes, because the voltage remains constant. The voltage is part of the chemical reactions in there. So when I was running both light bulbs, if this was a battery, I know I plugged it into the wall, but what changes, I guess, is really what you're asking, is the amount of current that comes out of here. And so this guy provides enough current to run this bulb and this bulb. You take that bulb away, then it provides less current. So the current can vary. What's constant is the voltage. The voltage is set at 120 volts. As you change your resistors, that affects how much current. So it's not that the current is a constant. You still look puzzled. Uh, I'm going to see if this helps. Here, I have some water pressure in this pipe. I don't know what it is. I'll just say it's 80 PSI. Okay? That's like this source. Okay? If I open it a little bit, I only have a certain amount of flow. Okay? If I open it a lot, I have a lot of flow. So the amount that flows can vary. And that's the same thing that's going on in this battery. The amount of chemical reactions, the amount of flow can vary. 
what remains constant is the water pressure. In there. That water pressure is still at 80 psi. And so, more resistance, less flow. Less resistance, more flow. But the amount of current that flows, yes, can, can vary. It's the voltage that remains the constant. And that, of course, and I should emphasize, that's for the systems we have. And we, I mean, we have specifically designed, I know this is not a battery, but when you have a battery, you have a chemical reaction. And then what good happens is, is the chemicals react. And if they need more current, then more chemicals react in order to keep the voltage at six. And so you're using up your chemicals at a faster rate, but you're always going to have six volts from your, from your battery. And so that's why we call it a constant voltage source. Now we could have constant current sources and we could look at that. It, it turns out we won't for this class. You will when you go on to your, if you go on to your circuits class. Uh, some of you are there. I am assuming you've done constant current. You're, you're obviously not in circuits, right? Oh, you are. Sorry. <laughs> so haven't you done constant current sources and constant voltage sources? Yeah. Constant voltage? Yeah. It's, it's very common to constant voltage. They're very easy to get, very easy to make. A bunch of chemicals together and nature takes care of the rest. If, if, if you need more, then the, the chemicals just react faster. And then the voltage stays at a constant six. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and I don't mean to embarrass you. I, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so, uh, but, uh, um, and, uh, and also, you know, th this can get pretty complicated because why does it keep a constant voltage is really something we didn't go into. That's the chemistry of the chemical reactions taking place and the redox reactions. And, and we haven't even dealt with that. that. That wasn't the goal of this class. That is part of the goal of your chemistry class when, when you go through chemistry. Um, and then advanced chemistry if you, you know, end up going into this type of field here. But, but uh, my argument then is going to be, and I just want to make this clear for everybody, we're going to treat this as a constant voltage that does not change. So what can vary is the amount of current that comes in and out. Okay? And so keep that in mind, uh, that the current can vary depending on how you set up. And it's really no different than this. I mean, you could have really asked a, a much simpler one. What if I hooked up a 5 volts to a 1 ohm resistor and that same 5 volt battery to a 3 ohm resistor. You see in this case you would have found the current by saying it's 5 volts divided by 1 ohm which is 5 amps. And so you would say you're getting 5 amps out of that battery but that exact same battery hooked up to a different resistor you would have gone okay the current is 5 amps divided by 3 ohms and you would have got 1.67 amps and you would have got, oh I got a different amount of amps coming out of that battery. See? Same voltage but a different current. Only because I have a different setup. Do you mean volts? Uh, I do mean volts here. Sorry. Getting ahead of myself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, even though this, this was maybe more last chapter. I'm hoping you see, and this is really kind of the same question you're asking now, here, but this is just a more complicated one. So, say you took like that and you just connected them to, to each other, like the positive and negative of that plug. Oh, so I did, I guess this? Yeah. Okay. Current then are you getting going? Okay, well then the current would be, I'm not going to plug it in, but the current would be the 120 volts divided by the resistance in these wires, which is really, really small, maybe a hundredth of an ohm. So if I go 120 divided by a hundred, well, I don't have to do a tenth, so I can keep it simple, tenth, that would be what, 1,200 amps? Now, the truth is then other things will take place because this is hooked to a panel over there in our electrical room that's got a circuit breaker. That circuit breaker is there to say, look, if you somebody hooks anything up that tries to demand more than 20 amps, 
shut off. So it has a 20 amp circuit breaker on there. Or actually this could be 25. It looks like the plugs are 25. But okay, so 25. But there's a limit on it. So I'm not going to really get that much current out of here. Um, so they put those because you kind of know like nothing's going to really need to pull that. Oh, well, that's more of a safety thing too is because now remember our power here is I squared R. So if I was getting a thousand 200 amps, even though it's a small resistance, that's going to be a lot of power, which first of all, I'm not sure the power grid could, could it handle that much. But even if it could, that's going to get real hot. And what I want to get hot is the light bulb. It's fine if the light bulb gets hot. But if this wire gets hot and this wire is in the wall and it gets hot, really hot, it's going to catch on fire. And that's what I don't want to happen. I don't want the wires in the wall to catch on fire. And so that's why that, that circuit breaker is there. Say, look, don't, we don't want our wires to ever have more than 25 amps. Because if they have more than 25 amps, depending on you know, how long they are and how thick they are, they're going to get hot. And that's our safety device. Could you show us how the inside of the circuit breaker works? Uh, I'll tell you what, how about in lab, we show, we got it, we got one that is it, probably best to show you. So in lab, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll show you. But it just gets a little warm in the thermal expansion. It's thermal expansion, just pulls it away. Um, at least the one we have is. Yeah, yeah. It's, it gets hot in thermal expansion. Breaks the contact, and then it's, it's, it's and I said I wouldn't say, but okay, but the spring goes up and it kind of jams into place. And when the thermal expansion kind of pulls it out of place, the spring pulls it back down. So there's a thermal expansion rod and get the top. Okay, so now I, I'm kind of hoping all that good stuff made sense. Let's do the next step. And the next step here is to say, well, let's look closer at these batteries. In fact, really, your question kind of leads into that because we had to dive a little bit into the operations of a battery here before the, uh, I could kind of answer that. And your author takes a moment. I use the lab to tell you more about batteries. So I'm going to jump back to the lab we did and say, look, do you remember doing the labs with a new battery and an old battery? Do you remember what our argument was with an old battery? Why, why did we call it an old battery? Why did it stop working? Yeah, it wasn't that the voltage from what we called the EMF went down, right? It was because an internal resistance buildup. So, so let's talk about that. Let's, let me just keep adding to what we had done here in um, the lab. And in the lab, you saw this. We took a battery. Now, in our case, we just took a single D cell here. And we said, let's look closely inside of it. I got a big one here so you can see inside a lot better. But I'll start with the smaller one here is a D cell cut in half. Uh, you can hopefully see the dark carbon and then the zinc around the outside and then the white of the reaction that has, has taken place. You might be able to see it better in this bigger one here. But there is the chemical reaction. But the point is there is a chemical reaction. That's where we get the energy. That's where we get the voltage. So again, without going into the chemistry of the redox reaction, a good way to describe a battery is really to break it into two pieces. To say that inside of the battery is an EMF. Okay, we like to just kind of give it a script E. I like to say this is the raw voltage. This is the voltage that is produced from the chemical reaction itself. And this is labeled at 1.5 volts. So when these chemicals react, we get 1.5 volts. They're about. Uh, you guys did energizing, energizing bunny, uh, <laughs> energizer <laughs> batteries and I think Duracell. I think we had a combination of, of those two. And, and so you were supposed to measure the EMF, which I think come out a little higher than that. It's like 1.56, 1.57. Is that what you guys were getting somewhere in that ballpark there? Okay, so that's the voltage you get. However, here's what tends to happen as a battery gets old. It's not so much that you don't get the 
same voltage. Now again, don't confuse voltage with energy because isn't the voltage how much energy you get per charge? So if you just had one chemical reaction, the voltage of one chemical reaction is the same as hundreds of thousands of chemical reactions, right? Because it doesn't matter how many chemical reactions you get, it's not the total energy that we're talking about when we mention voltage. Voltage is how much energy you get per charge. So one chemical reaction is not going to give you much energy, but it doesn't give you much charge, right? And so that ratio is the same voltage as if billions and billions reacted. That's going to give you a lot of energy, but it's also got to be divided by a lot of charge. Okay, so the voltage that takes place is the same regardless of whether you have a lot of chemical left or you just have one molecule left. The voltage doesn't change. Or I should say the EMF doesn't change. But what makes the battery kind of useless or getting on the edge of being useless is as you start to use these chemicals up the reaction that takes place is either further away from the electrodes or harder to get out and therefore you are going to have a voltage loss according to Ohm's law of how much current are you trying to get out of this battery times the internal resistance. So if you were to hook a voltmeter to this battery and at the same time hook this up to a load, and I hope this diagram looks familiar, that's what we did in the lab, right? The last step, step three in the lab last week was, was this. Use your homemade voltmeter, which we called the potentiometer, right? and measure the voltage reading on the battery while you are using the battery. And I'm hoping you can see here that what I would call then the terminal voltage of this battery would be the EMF, in other words, how much voltage do you get from the chemical reaction itself minus how much energy or voltage did you lose in the process of getting out. That's why a good battery, what would you want to say about your resistance? Yeah, really, really low, right? And you would like that to be as low as, as possible. So new batteries, they tend to be very low liquid batteries, they tend to be extremely low. What would be the advantage of a liquid battery then? Can you see it? I mean, if you really wanted to use this battery and draw a lot of current, like enough current to turn the starter motor to turn your engine in your car, that's going to take a lot, a lot of current. 300, 400 amps. What do you want about this resistance? Really, really small. And you can get that really small if you have a liquid that can flow around. These batteries here, where they're solids, is this the kind we use to start a car? Why not? Too much resistance, even when they're new. You're just not going to start a car. Even if you, you know, this is one and a half volts. So I guess if I stacked um, nine, well, that would be too much. Uh, it's 12 divided by one and a half. Uh, 12 by four, eight of them in series. So if I put eight of them, right, I can get 12 volts. Is this going to start my car? But it's 12 volts. How come this won't start my car? Yeah, you've got too much resistance in it. There's just no way you're going to get enough out. And when you try to hook it to your car, yeah, you've got 12 volts from your EMF, but in the process of getting it out, you lose so much, it's not enough to, to, to start your car. So we, you know, use the, the I'll call it old-fashioned liquid ones, because that's just what we need. Uh, they're a pain because they're liquids, 
Fortunately, they are in a car, so the weight of them is not that crucial either. But, you know, they're very heavy and they're liquidy mess, but if you really need it, you use it. And that's what we have them. Could you do it if you had enough in parallel? Um, I guess if I had enough, to, and I'm not sure how much enough is, but I would suspect it's quite a few. Um, probably to the point that it would be yes, less useful than just having a battery that's this big and weighs, you know, 35, 40, 50 pounds, whatever those things are. Yeah. Yeah. So. But, uh, yeah, in theory. Sure. Sure. So. Anyways, your author takes a little bit to, to analyze this and says, all right, that's how we have to think about when we hook up a circuit. Because now that we have this circuit here, isn't it this internal resistor in series with the load resistor? In other words, in that circuit that I have drawn there, what is the equivalent resistance? Isn't it the internal one? Plus the load? And if I were to ask you to calculate the current, how would you calculate the current here? Yeah, you would say, well, I got a voltage, call it the EMF in the battery. Divided by what? Okay, the equivalent resistance, which would be? Little r times big R, right? And so again, maybe this helps answer our question. Isn't the amount of current coming out of this battery dependent on not only the load resistor, what are you trying to run is if this is a, say, a light bulb or a starter motor to your car, but it also depends on your internal resistance, okay? And so that's going to affect your overall current. And in fact, in terms of order of events, your author actually starts the chapter with this first before he even gets into series in parallel. I thought I would approach it a little differently and do the equivalence first and then jump back over to here. Um, and I don't know if we need to spend too much time because we did so much time in the lab talking about the batteries and the, and the internal uh, resistance here. So this would be the current in that circuit. But here's an interesting question. Focusing more on this internal resistance. Isn't that internal resistance consuming some of the energy? Right? Isn't there power, what I would call, on the inside equal to I squared little r? <laughs> Where I would call power of the load I squared capital R, right? And so now that we figured out what the equivalent resistance is, we could get the current. And once we get the current, couldn't we look at the power that is on the load versus the power on the inside? Now, I would suspect that if this was a real circuit, you probably would want most of your power here. In fact, you would probably want this as small as possible. Fair enough? Because what's this power really doing? Nothing, Nothing but getting my energy source hot, right? Or maybe a good example. If this is a speaker and this is an amplifier, as I take my amplifier, which then has some internal resistance from the electronics, and I feed it to a speaker, probably what I really want is a lot of power to my speaker, right? But what I'd like to minimize is the power that is being consumed, if you will, in the amplifier. Because that's just getting my amplifier hot. So let's think about this for a moment. Let's say this is a stereo system. Let's say this is the amplifier. This is the speaker. Is there a maximum power I can get out of this amplifier? I mean, let's ask it this way. What if this resistance is really large? If this is a speaker with a large resistance, will that be very loud? Will there be much power there? No. Why not? 
Yeah, if this is really large, what would that say here about your current? It's pretty small, right? So as you think about the power that is going to your speaker, you would say, ooh, really small current. Now, you may say, well, that number's going to be pretty big. Okay, but this is current squared. This is more dominant. And you can kind of see that when you crank this up. You can begin to see that if this resistor gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, if this is really big, you really don't have much current. Without much current, you're not going to get much power. So I would say if this is a stereo system, if I actually want to do what we might call a power transfer, I want energy to go here. I want to start here and send it here. I want to generate it at the power plant and I want to send it to the city. I want to make the energy in the amplifier. I want to send it to the speaker, right? I want the signal from the router to come to here and get the strongest signal I can on my computer. Right? Whatever I'm trying to transfer, whatever I'm trying to send from here to here, I probably want this to be as big as possible. And having a large resistance is not the way to do it. <laughs> having a large resistance means you're not going to get much current. So that would tell me, oh, I should make the resistance lower and lower and lower. Uh-oh. But do you see there's a problem if I make it too low? I mean, if I made it all the way to zero, you can see it here. Yeah, I'd start to get a lot of current, but how much power do I get? Zero, right? Now that sounds funny. I'm lowering the resistance. I'm getting a lot of current and you're telling me zero power? Oh, I'm confused. Where's the power? Where's all that energy going? I thought there was a lot of current. It's going to the internal resistor, right? Did you catch that? And I think this one's a little harder to see, but just like we argued, you would not want to make this resistor too big because too big doesn't give you much current and we need current to transfer the information or the energy. All right, but at the same time, you really don't want this resistor too small. That might be a little harder to see. We'll do some math here in a second. But if you made this resistor too small, what you are essentially doing is getting a lot of current. And where does the energy go? To our amplifier, essentially. And so all of a sudden, we're cranking up our amplifier and we're not getting a lot of sound out of our speaker what we're getting is a hot amplifier and eventually we're gonna burn this amplifier up so that's not a good situation either so what I'm trying to say here is shouldn't there be a certain amount of resistance that would get the most power out of this amplifier what is it yeah and let's run through it it'll turn out that if this load resistor is exactly equal to the internal resistance, that's when you get the most power. If this load resistance is bigger than that, you're really cheating yourself out of the maximum power because you are not getting enough current. But on the other hand, if this resistor is lower than this one, you're still cheating yourself out of power here because you're consuming all the power there. And so this is what you'll see, we'll call the maximum power transfer theorem, okay? Uh, we'll say the impedance of the amplifier matches the impedance of the speaker. When those two match, when in this case, I'll just call it resistance. You'll see impedance is a little more than resistance real soon here. But when you say the resistance of your load, your light bulb, your speaker, your computer, your TV, whatever you're trying to send the information to, when that matches the internal resistance of your router going to your computer, your amplifier going to your speaker, your cable box <laughs> going to your TV, when those match, you will get the most power. And you see it here. You see it right here in this formula here. If I write the power on the load resistor equals to the current squared, so it is E squared little r times big R squared times big R, that is the amount of power that goes. And as you can see, you have com the, these competing forces. If the resistance is too big, 
or too small, you don't get the maximum power. If I made a plot of this power versus R, it would probably look a little bit like that, and it's going to peak right about there. I have yet to prove it to you, but that will peak when your load resistance is the same as the internal resistance. Yeah. What you're saying is that in the best case scenario, half of our battery's energy is being wasted on getting the battery hot. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, careful here. Um, your, if your definition of best is maximum power, that's true. Maximum energy delivered or maximum power. Okay, but, but with that said, when I pick up this calculator, okay, I've got four batteries in it, and I've got some really good high efficiency electronics in here. And so, what I do is I make this load resistance very large. So am I getting the most power out of the batteries at that moment that I could? Maybe I should say the most energy. No, I'm not. Because I am not matching the load with the internal resistor. However, what I am doing is getting enough power to operate it. And if you look closely, when this load resistance is many times bigger than this, then most of the power is here. So most of my power, I'll call it 99%. I'm not sure what it comes out to be. But when this load resistor is very large, 99% of the power is going to my load. Now, it's not as much power as I could get out of these batteries. But I don't need max power to run this. I would rather have max efficiency. I would rather have it on a low power scheme that can run for a month and I don't have to change my batteries for a long time. So in that sense, it's not half and half. But if I need to operate something at full capacity, if this is, I don't know if any of you ever drive those little remote control race cars. Those are done. You want to get the maximum power out of that battery as you can. And you match the load from your motors to the internal resistance of those batteries. And the, the truth is then, only half of that chemical energy in the battery ends up making the car go. The other half, as you said, goes to warming those batteries. And that's unfortunate but that's what I need to do to get maximum power out of it. So I don't always want maximum power for my batteries. Okay? But if I did want maximum power, as I often do when I'm sending a signal, let's say, right? or in case of this case, an, an amplifier, again, I may not want maximum um, power for my amplifier. You know? uh, I usually don't. You know? That's a little too loud for me, you know? as my kids tell me all the time. Oh, Dad, if it's too loud, you're too old. Uh -huh. Okay, either way, turn it down. <laughs> Drive me crazy. <laughs> so, you had a, let's say, a race car or whatever. Yeah. They wanted max power. Mm -hmm. If you connected two of those same batteries in parallel, then it would last more than twice as long because less is being wasted. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right, so yeah, so if you're into E, Efficiency, and as our conversation yesterday uh, was, it's, you are, you would want to have a, as, you know, as the electrical engineer building what you want, if you want to get the most energy from this battery into your load, well then make sure you design it in such a way, if possible, that your load has a much greater resistance than the internal resistance. Um, which is great for things that really don't require much power anyways. That, that's very doable. The hard one are the things that really need a lot of power, like race cars or just a real car. You know, getting to the electric car. If you want to really get an electrical car, we really want a, a lot of power there. And unfortunately, uh, we end up using half of it back into the battery. The batteries get hot. Um, if they're at maximum transfer. I mean, maybe they're not. I, don't, I really don't know how the electrical cars are, are, are built. They may, they may be closer to that. Because then that's the other issue with electric cars. Is you, uh, and, and maybe now that I think about it, maybe you don't want that. Because they, they are pretty, uh, their goal is to get more efficiency out of it. Uh, and get more uh, distance. Because you know, a lot of people, like myself included, I'd love to get an electric car. I just don't feel comfortable yet with them. Because, uh, you know, I... I you know, I need to get around town, I need to go shopping, I need to get the kids to soccer, and I need to, you know, do all these crazy things. I, I need to get about 100 miles plus in a given day before I can go back there. So unless I know I can get 100 miles out of it, I, it's just, you know, it's not going to be useful for me. I'm not going to be able to plug it in until I, 100 miles at the end of the day.
Yeah. All right, well, I said I would prove this to you, so let's take a moment to prove it. But I did want you to see conceptually that this is your maximum power transfer theorem. If you wanted to get the maximum power out of it uh, versus efficiency, then you would set your load resistor equal to your internal resistor. And I think you see that here. If I take the derivative of the power of the load as I change the resistance of the load. Right? Isn't that how you find a maximum? Right? You take a derivative of the function, set it equal to zero. Right? So what you're really saying here is I have a function. The power function changes depending upon how much load resistance I have. And I'm assuming the internal resistance doesn't uh, change here. But then I can set that equal to zero and solve the equation. And that's what will happen here. So if I take a derivative I have something that looks like this. I will leave the EMF alone. Um, maybe I'll even rewrite it so that I have to take a product rule instead of a quotient rule because uh, I, I think taking the product rule is a little bit easier. So I'll bring it upstairs and so this would be the first times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first chain rule. Oh, well, chain rule is kind of boring, all right? So there's my derivative set equal to zero. Since that is equal to zero, I can cancel it off. If I look closely at this, this is a positive exponent when it's downstairs. This then becomes 2r and r plus r cubed. Get a common denominator. Mean I have r plus, a little r plus big R minus 2r. Again, since it's equal to zero, I get zero equals r plus r minus 2r, which is r minus big R, which means r is equal to r. Yay, there we go. So all that math just to come up with hopefully what I was saying earlier, that if you're trying to get the maximum energy transferred from one to, to another, okay, make sure that your load resistor matches then your internal resistance, and you'll get it. All right, well, that's that little discussion on batteries, and um, that ties together with the first section of this and what we did last time in the, in the lab. Um, and so you're probably going to ask some questions when you do the homework, and rightfully so, because sometimes we say, Oh, hook up a 7-volt battery, and sometimes they say there is an internal resistance, and sometimes they don't. So if they don't say any internal resistance, take that to mean that the internal resistance is very small, much smaller than the rest of the resistors in your circuit, and you can ignore them. Likewise, for your wires, sometimes they will tell you the material the wire is made out of, sometimes they will tell you the length, and its diameter, they start doing all that, they want you to consider the resistance in the wires also. But a lot of times they don't. They just say hook it up. They don't say how long the wire is. Why? Well, like this one. This was 360 ohms. I didn't even worry about the resistance in the wires because that is less than one ohm, right? In fact, the lab you do this week, which I guess two-thirds of you have done it and the other third are going to do it today. Remember that wire we had in there? It was 10 meters long. Much longer than this one. It was much thinner than this one. And what did we get? Like a half a ohm? See, there's just not much resistance in a copper wire. A thick copper wire. Even a long, thick copper wire. So I've had these questions in the past where, wait a minute, we just got done with chapter 27. We just said every wire has some resistance and now we jump into 28 and we forget all about it. Well, we're not really going to forget about it. It's just a lot of problems we're not going to be concerned about. It, all right. So same thing with the internal resistance. I just went on a long discussion about how the battery has an internal resistance and sometimes we include it, sometimes 
we don't. So it just takes a little experience reading the problem and saying, okay, just remember this, that all wires and all batteries have resistance. They're usually pretty small to everything else. So unless they're specifying something in the problem that would give you the ability to calculate that resistance, they want you to treat the wires as no resistors and they want you to treat the battery as no internal resistance, you know, unless otherwise stated. So sometimes they will, sometimes they won't. Most of the time they won't. My first example then is let's go a step further. So far everything I've done has two resistors. How about we do four? What if I do this? What if I say, hey, let's take a power supply, 5 volts. Let's hook up a resistor number one, a resistor number two, a resistor number three, a resistor number four. Let's make a little chart over here and say if these are the resistors R1 equals R2 equals R3 equals R4 equals. Could you tell me the current, voltage, and power on each resistor here? And at the same time, let's actually hook it up here. Let me go ahead and take that circuit at 5 volts. So I'll come over here to my power supply and turn it back on and this time set it down to 5 volts. Alright, so there's 5 volts or pretty close to 5 volts. Okay, and so there's my 5 volt power supply. Let's hook up a couple of resistors. So, to make it more realistic, I went ahead and grabbed the uh, circuit board that uh, you guys were using in class. I uh, grabbed a little meter here so that we can kind of measure them here. And so, let me take a couple of wires. Let me just start at the top here and say, all right, I'll take this first one at the very top to be number one. And so I'll just hook up number one. I'll kind of move this out of the way. Set that up there and say, okay, what is the resistance of number one? Yeah, it looks like it says 86.3 and we will do our units in ohms. Our current in ooh, amps or milliamps? Uh, well, how do I put amps? our voltage and our power. Right. All right, let me go to the second one. The second one is right below it. Number two then, 75.2. No, 75.2 ohms. Let me go to the third one on our circuit board that you guys used in lab, 58.9. Let me go to resistor number four. Forty point two. All right, but here is my point. If I gave you the voltage of the supply, I gave you the circuit, what it looks like, I gave you the four resistance, could you find the current and the voltage in every one of those? And I claim you can. Let's go through it here. Right? This is what this chapter is all about. Like I said, there's no new physical principles here, but we should be able to calculate it here. And I guess I would start off by saying, is this equivalent to anything? I mean, could I simplify it a little bit? Do you see anything here? Anything in series? Anything in parallel? Is R1 in series with R2? Oh, is it in series with R3? Okay, what did series mean again? Same current. Do you see what's happening here with the current? 
If I were to draw a picture of these uh, little charges that are coming out, there's the current. Maybe I would even call this current number one as it goes through this resistor and so all these little electrons. Or if this is water flowing in a pipe, this is the water coming into the house, let's say. But do you notice what happens when it gets right here? At what we'll call a junction or a node. Do you see how they can split? Do you see how some of them can go this way, which I'll call I2? And some of them will go this way, which I will call I3. That split right there tells me something very important. <laughs> they are not in series, right? Because what was required to be in series? Same current. So, just like we did for the capacitors, and most of you did right on the test, but some of you confused that circuit on what was in series and parallel. Let's go through this again. You need to recognize whether they're in series or in parallel, or you'll be tempted to use the wrong equation here. Okay, and so those are not in series. Bummer. Well, maybe something else here. How about how about this? How about R two? Does it isn't R two in series with R four? No. I wish it was. Should be a lot easier problem. But it's not. How do I know that? Yeah, look at I3 here. Watch I3 as it comes around here. I3 comes around and then regroups, right? Right here. At that node, at that junction. And so then I got a current that is coming in here at I4. But I number four is not the same as I2 because it has grouped together. Again, if the analogy helps, this could be water coming into your house, right? Here comes the water into your house. This is the water that's flowing through the main line coming to your house. A lot of water. But as it comes into your house, it splits right here. This goes to shower one. This goes to shower two, right? The total water that goes to shower one and shower, or yeah, one and two go to or come from the main line. So, I would not say that the same amount of water that goes to these two showers is equal to what comes in, but I could say something about the sum of those two, right? What would I say about the sum of those two? The sum of these two currents has to equal that current, right? That's our conservation of charge. And, and we're going to take advantage of that here in just a minute here, okay? But right now, I can clearly see that that's not in series with this one. This one's not in series with this one. This one's not in series with this one. Because again, here's the shower. The, the, the two showers go down the drain. Now, somewhere under the house, the drain merges together. And then the water that goes out the main sewer line is the total sum, right? Oh, so what would that tell me about these guys? Oh, so you see the water coming into the house equals the water leaving the house? As it should be. You don't want water building up in the house, you know. There's a bathroom getting taller, you know. There's, those water molecules have to go somewhere. So we know what comes into the house leaves the house. So we're going to see that current one and current four are the same, right? All right, so I don't have anything in series here. Bummer. Wish it was. Hmm. Anything in parallel? Yeah, they're parallel if they have the same voltage, right? And so I kind of like to color code these. I like to say, look, let me draw on top of this wire green right here a wire. If a wire doesn't have any resistance in it, there is no change in voltage anywhere along that wire. As I said, sometimes that is true, sometimes that's not true. We will look at problems where sometimes we include the resistance of the wires. Most of the time we do not. So if there's no resistance here, there would be no change in voltage. We would apply Ohm's law and the resistance would be zero and there'd be no change in voltage. So everywhere I've drawn green should have the same voltage. Yeah. Can you say they're in parallel if they make a loop with no other element in the loop? Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So why is it that R1 and R4 are not in the series? Oh, uh, I guess they would be. Yeah. They, 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, but uh, I, and I could do that. I just don't want to do that first. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, I, I, uh, they are. I'm glad you noticed. Uh, but what I, yeah, bummer. Now I should probably go that way since you mentioned it. But no, you're going to miss my point. I want you to see that these guys weren't in series, but these two are in, in parallel. And you may not have seen that here. I like to say, look, if I then color code this wire, 
and this wire and this wire and this wire those all have the same voltage right so as you look at resistors say number three it goes from green to blue if you look at number two it goes from green to blue so isn't that the same change in in voltage or the way you said it was kind of nice if I drew a loop here right if I get back to where I started and there was just all, just those two they must be in parallel I drew them purposely at 90 degrees so that you would not say oh they're in parallel because they look like parallel lines that's the mistake that you, students at the beginning often run into they look at two parallel lines and they go oh, two parallel lines must mean they're in parallel no they don't have to be parallel lines to be parallel in their electronics okay and just like series they don't have to be a same line to be in series they can go out and then bend 90 degrees but as long as all the current goes here goes to there then they're in series okay so you got to stop and look at it not from the geometry but from the electronics to answer is it in parallel or is it in in series okay but those of you who noticed uh, very good two and three are in parallel so if I was drawing an equivalent circuit the first step I might do is to replace two and three together with its equivalents. And doing the math here, two is 75.2 ohms, three is 58.9 ohms and so after a little calculator work here I should get the equivalent resistance so 75.2 reciprocated 58.9 reciprocated added reciprocal of that equals about a 33 zero so those two in parallel should be about 33. Now, maybe it's a little easier to see, but I claim that that too can be simplified. What would you say about one and this equivalent of two and three and four? Zero. Yeah, can you see how all the current goes here, goes to there? There's no place else for it to go. The water coming into the house goes to one shower. That means all the water coming into the house goes to the shower. That's the only thing on. It's the only place for the water to go. And then that shower goes down the drain, and so all the water going down the drain also goes out the sewer line. Right? So the current that goes into the house, through the shower, down the sewer line, they're all the same. And that's what we mean by series, right? So how would I get the equivalent resistance? of those three yeah we're just going to sum them together so I will take the 86.3 I will then take the 33.0 for the equivalent of those and then I will take the 40.2 and I will add them all together this should be the equivalent of the whole circuit so 86.3 33 and 40.2 coming up to be 159 and a half ohms. So there's my equivalent resistance of that circuit. And this is what I was trying to illustrate both when we did capacitors and now that equivalent circuits are useful in coming back to finding the real thing. So is this circuit going to help me get to here? Perhaps. If it doesn't, then this is a waste of my time. Is this circuit going to help me get back to there? Uh, perhaps. And I would say definitely it is. And if it is, it's going to help me get back. In fact, what it'll allow me to do is a quick calculation. This is the nice thing about equivalence. Couldn't you find the total current here real easily? Right? This is where Ohm's law becomes really nice. What we can do is we could just say, okay, let's take 5 volts. And let's divide it then by this overall equivalent resistance and that should give me my current so 5 volts divided by 159.5 is 
zero point zero three one amps or thirty one milliamps is my overall current now that's the equivalent one and like I said equivalent ones are pointless unless they really help me back here at the real thing and I claim they do what do you notice about that equivalent one in this real thing isn't this telling me that the current that comes out of here is 0 0.031 and if you look closely then the current that comes out of here this is current number one right so that's why it would help me right away it would allow me to find what is the current in the first one and 0 0.031 amps is the uh, current coming out of that first one. Oh, good and you noticed it what else yeah and the last one because as we said earlier the four and one are going to be the same because they're going to come over here and they're going to split and and come down to here so that's where it becomes very significant and very useful right in fact I would say that depending on how you want to do this we may or may not even come back to this one um, but I would always like to say look if I already know two of these then I can get the third and the fourth they, they're coupled together here so as long as I've got one and four maybe I should finish the rest of the the calculation here and use Ohm's law in our uh, power equation to figure out what what it is because this resistance times this current should give me the voltage so the 86.3 times the 0 0.031 should give me the voltage of 2.67 and of course the power then would be I got all three combinations I can go V times I I can go I squared R or I can go V squared over R I mean which of the three options you want to pick you can do either one of them I'll just do the product of these two and because uh, I already got the voltage there in my calculator so I'll go 0 0.031 and so this power would be 0 0.0829 for the amount of power that uh, that first one would be con consuming and warming up and I hope that's not too much to change the resistance because I do want to hook these up and make sure I get the same readings that we calculate here um, but if they warm up then the resistance changes and there's a little bit of play there but if we, if we get something close we'll be happy uh, same thing down here right I can take the current 0 0.031 I can multiply it by the resistance of 40.2 and get a voltage of 1.25 volts which would then also power would be that voltage times the current and that would be 0 0.03 how many decimals should I go 86 I'm kind of wondering if I shouldn't have gone another decimal well maybe we'll have some rounding errors too so between rounding and a little heating hopefully we'll be reasonably close when we hook this up here okay all right so there is my first part of my my chart now obviously I'm not done um, but uh, if you see I've got many options to do here um, maybe the thing to do since I'm doing equivalent circuits is to jump onto this one right because if I look at this equivalent resistance which we already said was 33 ohms and I realize that the current in this equivalent one is really the same current in this equivalent one right so if I multiply it by the current through here aren't you saying the voltage across this equivalent one and so if I do this quick calculation that is a hair more than one volt but why is that helpful well again it's helpful if it makes any sense back here right do you see the connection this is the voltage over the equivalent one well that's what these two parallel ones said right and so those two parallel ones then should be 1.0 what I get 1.02 1.02 uh oh doesn't quite add up you got too much rounding uh, maybe I'll come back here 0.0, .0 what was this 
5 divided by 159.5 Point zero. Maybe I should have done a three one three. Well, I'll tell you, I'm just gonna just blame it on rounding and not go back and fix it here. But but I think we've got some rounding ones. Why do I say that? Yeah, shouldn't they add up to five volts here? I mean not all four of them, right? But which one should add up to five? Yeah, again, we're back to this picture. If you kind of imagine yourself inside of this little tiny loop here, right? If this is, a, by my analogy, this, this hiking trail, if you were to hike up the front of the mountain, you're saying you should go up five volts. That's what the battery is saying. So instead of going up the front of the mountain, you go up the side of the mountain. Or you go up the back of the mountain. Shouldn't you still get to five volts? So one, two, and four need to add up to five. Or... 1, 3, and 4 need to add up to 5. Not that all four of them have to add up to 5, which is an easy, common mistake here. So do mine add up to 5? And I think we're a little shy here, aren't we? Uh, if I were to add a 2.67 for number 1 and a 1.25 for number 4, and then a 1.02, I'm at 4.94. Okay. Close. <laughs> With a little bit of rounding. All right. So, taking in the rounding, I think I did it right, right? And so there is the voltage around the loop. Which, by the way, do you see that that could have given me the voltage here? I could have realized that this plus this is 5, and then started with 5 and subtracted that, subtracted that, and got that number. I didn't even have to come back to this circuit. That's kind of the neat thing about the, the, this, these circuits and these tables, as I said with the capacitors. You pretty much know when you're all done whether you've got the whole thing right or there's some mistakes along the way. Because as you start to solve it, you start to get multiple ways of finishing it. When you get to the end, you should realize that, okay, I did it this way, but this should also add up and you can check. Does it add up to five? Okay. So I went ahead and I used this circuit to get the voltage. And then check to see if it added up to 5. I could have just as easily said it already added up to 5 and got the voltage and then come back to this circuit to see if it checks out to that resistance and see if it matches, right? And so I had those, those two options, right? Now again, same comment as before. Once I have two of these, I can find the third and then also find the, the power. So there finishes the problem by then using Ohm's law which is this voltage divided by that resistance. 75.2 coming up with a current of 0 0.013 and we'll carry one more decimal place because it's pretty close to the middle there, 6. And then likewise here I could take that voltage, 1.02 and divide it by a 58.9 and then we got 0 one, seven, three. And of course, once I have those, I can get the power. Here, I can take the current, 0 0.0136 times 1.02, and I get a power of 0 0.139. And here, I get a power of 0 0.0173 times 1.02, and I get 0 0.0176 for my power there. Okay. Now I can probably check this because what do I know about this conservation of current issue? What do I, what do I know? Now that I found current 2 and 3, what does current 2 and 3 need to add up to? Doesn't that have to add up to 1? Again, back to this analogy, if this is the water coming into the house and it goes to the two showers, doesn't the water, the sum of the water going to the two showers got to equal what's coming in? And for that matter, the sum coming out has to equal four. So whether you want to take two and add it to three to see if it equals four, or two added to three and it's equal to one, and we already know one and four were the same, so we don't need to do it twice, we just need to check one time. But if I've done things right here, that's what it should add up to be. Alright, so what do these two 
add up to be? I guess that's a 10, 20, 30, ooh, 39? 39. Zero, yeah. Zero, three, oh, good, zero. Yeah, good, uh, yeah, 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 zero, nine. Yay, which rounds to three, one. All right, so again, within some rounding issues, right, it does come out to the same number, right? And so as it, as it should. In fact, I'm not done here. Let's look at the power here for a moment. I mean, this is the power being consumed on each resistor, right? And so each of these are resistors are getting warm. And if I get out my calculator, I would say, okay, each of these four resistors, if these are maybe four light bulbs here, but each of these is going to give me the total power, 0 0.0829 for the first power. The second one is 0 0.0139. The next power is 0 0.0176. The next power is 0 0.0386. And all of that then is 0.153 watts for the total power of all four of these as they are warming up. Now, where did they get their energy from? Okay, well, they're getting in from the current, right? And the current got its energy from the, from the battery, right? The energy in, in this battery here. So, couldn't I then assume, using conservation of energy, that whatever power is coming out of this battery, is then being delivered to those four resistors. Okay, so my power coming out of the battery should equal the sum of those four. If it doesn't, I would be violating conservation of energy. Which, other than giving me a bad grade, would probably be a great discovery in history because we'd solve all the world's energy problems, right, as we discussed before. But it's, that's not going to happen. So if I've done my math right, I should come back and look, and it, at this point it doesn't really matter what circuit I look at, Maybe it's easier to see it in this circuit, but isn't all of this current coming out of this battery? So to calculate the power coming out of this battery, I'll just go current times voltage. And as we see here, the current was our 0 .031, and our voltage was our 5 volts. So, uh, is that a 15.5? And so again, other than maybe a rounding there in the last decimal place, it does show that the energy coming from the battery is then being consumed by the resistor. So yay, it, it matches. Okay. And so everything seemed to fit together, which is kind of my indication that I bet it, it worked out right. Now let's actually hook it up, right? What does this crazy thing look like? All right, well, here's my circuit board. Okay. Here's my power supply. Maybe I'll start over here with my power supply ready to go. Here is my voltages. I'll just grab these wires here and kind of set that down on the side. So there's my, I don't want them to cross too much, all right? But there's my five volts, okay? Here's my resistor board. And so maybe I'll, I'll hook it up here, let's see. Make sure I get the right order. Uh, we call this number one, this one number two, this one number three, and this one number four. Fair enough? Okay. So, as I go to hook this up, I will say I'm going to take my power supply and hook it right there. That's resistor number one. Everything's going to go through number one and then go where? Number one goes to two, but it also goes to three. Fair enough? So I'll start again. Is this starting to look like this? <laughs> That's what I have, right? Coming through number one. And this connection I have here is that green color right there. It is connecting the end of number one to the beginning of two and the beginning of three. Okay? So there's two and three. Now again, looking at that circuit carefully, doesn't it say two and three hook back up together? 
Okay, and so that's what this one is doing. That's that blue wire there. Two and three hook together. But that's not all two and three do. After two and three hook back together, two and three go to number four. All right. Still looking okay? Okay. Comes in here. End of number one goes to the beginning of two and three right there. The end of two and three right here group together and go to number four. And then number four goes to the negative on the on the power supply. Okay? So I ask again, does it they look the same yet? Good. A lot more of you are saying yes. Good. All right. Now, before I even hook it up to the circuit, didn't we calculate the equivalent resistance at 159? All right. So I'll try my luck here. I'll hook it here. I'll hook it here. What do I get? Yay! 159.7. Works. Okay. So then if I come over to here and I hook up my circuit, uh, let me make sure I get it right. The uh, one was up here, so the 5 volt power should go here, and the negative should go at the end of number 4 there. Right? And so there, I'll hold it up. Does that look like that? Okay. Well, sort of? Good. Well, many of you are saying yeah. Alright. And so there's my, my circuit. Now, if I change this to a voltmeter, Didn't we just say the voltage should be about 2.78? Alright. So number one, uh oh, which one was number one? Uh, the top. So here's number one. And I'll just hook my voltmeter right on the top. What do I get? Yeah, 2.695. 2.67, right? What was the voltage on number two? Number two says 102. What I get here? 103. Okay. Voltage on number three. And so notice how I'm hooking up the voltmeter. And I know we did this in lab, but it's worth going through here in, in class. Notice what I'm doing is parallel connection, right? I'm coming along here, and to hook up the voltmeter, I'm just connecting right there. Those two little electrodes on the end reach in and they grab the energy of the electrons before and after and measure their difference. Okay, so I hooked the voltmeter here, got its voltage. I hooked the voltmeter here, got its voltage. I am currently hooked up right here, voltmeter, and I soon will do voltmeter there. I hope I got a 102 on this one too, did I? Yeah, 103, okay. And then finally, last step, a voltage anyways, is I should be able to connect it to that last one and get the voltage on the fourth one. And sure enough, uh, 125 when I get here, 125.6. Right? Now the harder one, and we've done this one time in lab, but this is one I really want you to see. It's because you need to see it now, you need to do it in lab, and it gets a little harder. How do I measure the current? Yeah. Making an ammeter and measuring the current is a little bit harder because you can't just come around and grab from the outside. You have to actually open it up so that the current can go through your meter. Because remember, your meter is doing just that. It's trying to count how many electrons go through. And so they got to go through your, your meter. So to make an ammeter, you got to open it up. To make an ammeter, you got to open it up and put your ammeter in that part of the loop, right? And so, the last set of connections would be something like this. Let me disconnect my meter. Let me switch it to an ammeter and see if this makes sense to you. I'll start with the first one and go right here. This wire is going from here to the battery. Fair enough? So, if I come over here and I break it open here, because that's what was going to the whole circuit, and I feed it 
into the ammeter and from the ammeter back it should be then counting how many electrons go through there and this says 30.2 uh, milliamps and so we're at 31 milliamps so within rounding it'll work if I then disconnect my meter and hook the power cord back up I can get the second one okay now the second one is right here maybe I should hold it up but remember it goes through here and it goes into the second one so right here before it goes into the second one I'm gonna open it up and I'm gonna feed it into my meter and then back where it was so I can see what's going through and it looks like I got a 13 and I calculated a 13 right? again disconnecting my meter and hooking my circuit back up I can do the third one okay again looking carefully this is the one going in to number three so if I break that open right there going into number three and feed it into my meter and then feed it back where I broke it open so now it can go through that should be the current going through number three and uh, round to a 17 and I got a 17 there too okay so it does match and I could do the fourth one but I want to make sure we do one more thing we're not even gonna we're gonna be close to finishing the chapter but not quite here but I want you to see one more thing here I did a, a very long problem here as an as a example because I think it illustrates um, all the ones that you will do that at least can be thought of as series or parallel. And I'm hoping that by doing this example and the, putting real numbers in here and hooking it up, it'll help you in terms of hooking them up and seeing the real world, but also help you in terms of your calculation and filling in this table. Uh, so I think you could probably do any other combination of circuits that are series and parallel. But let's look at one more. Do you remember last time I kept warning you that you can have resistors in series, parallel, or neither, right? I mean, let me start here. What if I draw another circuit here? What if I say, all right, let's take a five volt circuit Let's put resistor 1 here. Let's put resistor 2 here. Then let's go on through. Call this resistor 3. Call this resistor 4. Let's regroup them and send them back. Could you do that circuit? You see anything in series? Anything in parallel? 1 and 3? What would you say about 1 and 3? Series. Yeah. I mean, if I was attacking this one, probably the first thing I would do is say, okay, this is equivalent to that, right? Where I have looked at one and three and said, look, put one and three together, put two and four together, they're in each in series, right? And then once I see that picture, what would that picture tell me? Yeah, that looks like they're in parallel. So then I would take another step and say that is equivalent to this. And now we're just doing the same problem that I just did. So we don't have time to do it. No, no, I want to do it. I think you can do it. Is you can then quickly take the voltage here and divide it by the overall equivalent resistance and get the total current, right? And then from that, you can begin to fill in the chart, saying what is the current in each of these and what is the resistance. And I bet you could go through and look at that circuit, that circuit, and that circuit, and from that, get current, voltage, and power in every resistor. Let me change it, though. Let me put a resistor down the middle. How are we going to do something like this?
Do you see anything in series or in parallel? Yeah, there is no series and no parallel here. I mean, let's go through it. What was it required to be in series? What do they have the same? Current. Well, parallel? Voltage. Voltage, right? Maybe I should grab a couple of different colors here and kind of indicate that, but if I look at, say, parallel. Parallel means they have to have the same voltage, right? And so if I start color coding these, I might say, well, this wire here is all in black. And so they have the same voltage on each side of that resistor. But if I go to the other side of resistor number one, and I color code it in blue here, notice the wire going from resistor one does not go all the way over to resistor two. Meaning that there is going to be a change of voltage as we cross over resistor number five, so this will be a new voltage, so I'll call it red. So notice resistor number two is black to red, resistor number one is black to blue. Or the way you phrased it I think was pretty good. If you go all the way around a loop, you should just hit the two elements that are in parallel with each other. If you hit another element in there, that's going to change the voltage and therefore they won't have the same voltage. So this two are not parallel anymore. The reason they came out to be parallel, be uh, well I guess yeah, they weren't even parallel before here because they weren't connected there. But these two were uh, in, in series. And then likewise, if we go down to the other side, um, I don't have another color but I guess I will use the green here, but the green part of the circuit here, but green and green. You can see that resistor number three is blue to green, resistor number uh, four is red to green, five is blue to red. There is no same voltage anywhere on here, is there? There is no loop you can take where you only get two elements to say they're in parallel. Doesn't happen. So none of these are in parallel. Oh, well, maybe they're series then. Well, no, they're not that either. That's what I was saying. Don't, don't just fall in, okay, well, if they're not parallel, they've got to be series. No, they're series, parallel, or neither. Right? Because series says they have the same current. Now, before I put this cross one in here, we did say one and three were series. What we said is the current would go through number one, and everything that went through number one then had to go on through number three. That doesn't happen anymore. Why not? There's a split right here. There's a node or a junction. There is a chance here that the current gets here and veers off to the side. And because of that, the current going through this one does not match the current going through that one. Likewise here. So none of these have the same current and none of these have the same parallel. This is a good example of neither. <laughs> Are they series? No. Are they parallel? No. Can we use any of those fancy formulas? No. How are we going to do it? Let's go back to how do we get those fancy formulas. Didn't we just do conservation of energy and conservation of charge? So let's go back and do that. And we're going to call these Kirchhoff's rules, right? And I don't know how I'll have time to write it on the board, but at least I'll have time to write out the equation. Let's do this for a moment. Let's give it some notation. Let's say that the current going through number one is current one. The current going through number two is number two. The current going through number three is number three. The current going through number four is number four. And the current going through number five is number five. And that one's even harder because I'm not even sure what direction the current goes in number five. Does it come this way and go across or does it come down this way and go across? Fortunately, and I'm going to run out of time, so I'll have to do this on Tuesday. Fortunately, it doesn't really matter. We can write out the equation, and really we can just pick which way we're going to call positive. And then if we do the math and we come up with negative, that means it's opposite to the direction we chose as positive. So we'll just take advantage of our algebra using positive and negative numbers. So don't really think that you have to know. You wouldn't know if this was a river, you would see the water being pumped up coming across as it splits at the fork, I think it's fair to say you would realize that the water goes down this way for both of these. 
But then when the water gets a chance to come together, it will flow this way if this is at a higher potential than that one. Or it will flow that way if this one is at a higher potential on that one. And so again, we're not really sure which that's going to be. But I would just say don't worry about that as you'll see in the math. But unfortunately I didn't save enough time to do this complete math. But then it'll go that way. So I'm pretty sure that 1, 2, 3, and 4 are the right directions. But if I'm wrong, I'll get a negative number. It's 5 to be quite honest that I have no idea. <laughs> I'm just going to call to the right positive and if it comes out to be a negative number that means it's to the left. But let's write this out. Look at this junction right here. Let's use conservation of charge. What would this little junction right here, what we're going to call Kirchhoff's node rule, his first rule, conservation of charge. What do you know there? Right. Conservation of charge is saying what comes in has to equal what goes out. So I would write this as I1 equals I3 plus I5. Fair enough? That's what I get. What comes in equals what goes out. Yeah, how about the other little junction here? This other node. What does this tell me? Right there. Yeah, what's coming in is 2 and 5. Fair enough? All that water, all those charges coming in. Got equal? What comes out? And so there would be two useful equations, right? Now, how many equations do I really need? I would say five. Why? Five unknowns, right? Current one, two, three, four, and five. So this is a good start. But I got more to do, don't I? Yeah. All right, so I've used conservation of charge, Kirchhoff's junction rule. What about the other one? Don't I have conservation of energy? Okay. Which we'll call Kirchhoff's loop rule. Right? We know that if you go all the way around the loop, the ups equal the down. Right? Or put another way, if you go all the way around the loop, the total voltage change will be zero. Alright? So let's do this. Let's think about going on a little hike where we go up, we go down, we go down. Isn't your total change zero? So, I would go up 5 volts. Then I would go down according to Ohm's law, that much. Then I would go down again and I get back where I started. So all the ups, added to all the downs, got to get a change of zero. That's my conservation of, of energy. You'll read it in the book as Kirchhoff's loop rule. He'll say add up all the voltages around the loop and you will get zero. Now, the hard part of this though is deciding is it an up or a down? Did you notice I went around the loop this way? What would happen if I went around this way? Uh, and I'll stop here in a second here, but what would, how would this equation look different if I started here and I went here? Wouldn't this be R3, I3, but I would put a plus? Why would I put a plus? Whereas last time, I'm going up? How do I know I'm going up? Doesn't the current go downhill? Again, if the analogy helps. If you are standing in a creek and you are walking against the current, are you going uphill or downhill? You gotta go uphill, right? The water flows downhill. End of story, right? So, when I did this time, I went down. I went with the current. I was imagining myself walking through that little circuit and I'm going with the current. And I know when I'm in a creek and I'm walking with the current, I'm going downhill. When I go this way and I'm walking against the river, I go uphill. What do I do here? 
Wouldn't this be uphill? And then what would this be? And this is probably the easiest one. The big line means higher energy. This little line means lower energy. So you're going from high to low. So minus 5. Would you agree those are the same equations? Yeah. So my point is it doesn't matter which way you go, right? But I really wanted to illustrate it that I'm not going to do clockwise and counterclockwise. That's not two new pieces of information. But what it does hopefully tell you is that this is how you're going to decide whether you put a positive or a negative, a negative or a positive. You got to decide if you go uphill or downhill. So, so far I guess I have three equations. I need two more, right? So I need five equations to solve for five unknowns. So, got some algebra to do next Tuesday. <laughs>